So what we're going to be talking about today is documenting processes um, on the process tools page. So just as a reminder, you can get to the process tools page two different ways. One is to go right through your four key functions and then select the process. Easy as that. And this takes you to what we call the process tools page. Another way that you can get here, just another avenue, is to go um, right through a job description. So once you've linked all of your processes to job descriptions, uh, you can select the process from the job description itself and go, again, right to the process tools page. This little trail here always shows you where the process lives on the four functions list, if you didn't notice that already. So when you access something from a job description, if you're wondering where it is on the four functions, it's this trail will always tell you, and you can always get to it just by clicking these links that takes you right back to where the process is. There, when you're on the process tools page, there's kind of a loop that shows you um, everywhere the process is. So here is where it is on the four functions list. This little breadcrumb trail shows you that. And then if you go link to job description, you can see all the job descriptions it's been linked to. So once on the process tools page, you can easily see where you've linked it to what positions and then also where it is on the four functions list. So what we're going to do is I'm just going to talk in general about the process tools page and all the functionality that exists here. And then we're going to specifically talk about work plans and checklists today. Um, and then next week, we'll finish it out with the rest of the process tools. So when you're on the process tools page for a process, the first thing you're going to see is right here in the middle, it shows you the title and the objective. So if you want to edit the title of the process, you just select it. So everything is clicked to edit. And then here I can change the title and hit say or cancel. Right underneath the title is what we call the objective. This is the purpose of the process. Why is it here? What does it exist for? This is best if it's a sentence or a phrase, which describes, again, what the overall result or purpose of the process is. Um, I've seen these kind of written casually, like how to generate referrals in this example. Or you can do it more formal with, like, ensure that all referrals are generated. So think about how you like these objectives. And the reason that it's important is, number one, the objective defines what's in the process. And this is helpful before you go to document, because you can kind of decide what the scope of it's going to be. What is it going to actually produce? And that helps you to define what tasks go into the work plans. The other reason that it's um, important is these objectives show up on the job description. So here under these titles, you see these black objectives. So when, and here's that referral one. So when an employee is looking at their job description, they can see a, a short sentence on um, what is in this process. All right. Also on the, with the process details, which is what this is called, the details of the process, you can also have access to this button, which marks the process as complete. Um, and it turns the process title black. That's really the only impact that it has. So here on the four functions list, you'll notice the color coding, which we went over in the very first session. Blue means it's got something in it. It's got tools in it, but it's not completed yet. Red down here means there's nothing in it, so it's, it's just a title right now. And then when you're finished with the documentation, you can um, fill in this box and turn the process title black. You can also uncheck the box. So if you've documented a process and then you decide it needs to be innovated, it's not working right, you can uncheck the box and then the title will turn blue again. So this is completely manual for you deciding when the documentation is done. Also in this view, you can put the process in the public folder by checking this box. So what that does is it puts the process in this folder here on the home screen. So you'll notice it's here now. The public folder is for company-wide information. It's for processes that aren't linked to different people's job descriptions on the org chart here. They're everybody's accountability. 
everyone needs to have access to them and needs to be able to use them. So we reserve those types of processes for this field right here um, called public processes. When you select a process from the public folder, you can't edit or change anything. It's opening it in the control panel view. So here I can just go to this process and complete things. I can't edit the original content at all. OK. So this is called the details of the process. And when I hit this button up here called link to job description, you'll notice it'll flip back to the details of the process. I'm sorry. If I'm on another tool like this one, you'll notice up here it says edit process details. That will always take you back to the details of the process. So when you're on any other screen on the process tools page, um, other than the details screen, then you can always get back to it by clicking that button up above. Or you can always hit this at the end, this process that's at the end of the trail, and it'll always take you back to the details screen. So right here at the top, I'm just going to go over these toolbar items. Um, link to job description, I showed you that a few minutes ago. This tool just allows you to see which um, job descriptions the process has been linked to. I can also link it and unlink it from this screen. So anything that's orange is a job description that the process has been linked to. If I want to unlink it, I can just select it, and you see it's taken it off. It's not orange anymore. If I want to link it, I can select a gray position. This is strategic or tactical, the two sections of the job description. And then I just hit link, and then it's linked it back. So this is just a quick help tool that allows you to see where you've linked the process, and then it also is a good way to kind of confirm that you've got this process on all the right job descriptions. Once you build the job descriptions from the org chart view, if you do a double check of the process and just make sure that you've got it on the correct job descriptions. This button here allows you to view what's in the archive. So you have the ability to archive any one of the process tools here. So what happens is you're on a work plan, and you decide you want to innovate it. Or you assign an employee to um, make changes to it. A good protocol would be to archive this original and then make changes, in a sense, creating another version. So how to archive is you just select the title. And I usually suggest that you put a version. You can do like version 1 if you want. You don't have to do this, but it just helps you to, to see the different versions if you're going to do multiple versions. And then I would save it. And I go to this little black box here that says Archive. I hit the Archive, and I say OK. So now Touchstones just put a version of this work plan into the archive. Now I can go and you know, I change the title back, and I can make changes to this in any way that I want. If I then want to go and see the old version, I hit this View Our Archive. I hit the drop down here and choose the type of tool I'm looking for. And then it's going to show me um, everything that I've put into the archive. So here's this work plan that we just archived. It'll show you the date and the time that it was archived. And then if you want to restore it, you just hit this button called Restore. And then it's going to take that work plan, and you can see put it back over here in the process tools. So you can view it from the archive um, just by clicking the title. Like, here's another version. Now I'm looking at this archived version right here. I haven't restored it. I'm just looking at it. And you can also print it or export it to Word from the archive. But once you hit Restore, it's going to put it back over here into the process tools. Now I'm going to go and delete this work plan here that I just restored. And that'll kind of take me to here, this next tool. So to delete a work plan or any tool, you just hit the black X and you say OK. And then that tool's been deleted. If you and you'll notice it's gone over here. So I archived that, and then I looked at it, and then I deleted it. So now it's gone from the active process tools page. If I'd done that accidentally, I could go here to view deleted and go and find it. So here's all my deleted um, processes or work plans in this process. And here again, I can view the deleted, or I can go to this button and restore it. 
So when you delete something from the process tools page, it's not actually gone. It's just put like into this trash bin, which we call view deleted, and, they, and it can be restored. Um, okay, so let's go over these icons. Uh, this icon here will take a work plan and turn it into a checklist. So that's kind of a cool feature. If I select this, I just hit it once, I say OK. And now touched on taken this work plan that I was just on and made it into a checklist. So it essentially just takes the tasks of the work plan and puts them next to these checklist boxes. A lot of times all a checklist is is the task of the work plan that um, that you need verification that's been done. So you can take that work plan and turn it into a checklist. This is still a work plan, though. You see it's still right here. And if I click back on it, I see it in its original state. So it doesn't disrupt the work plan at all. All it does is kind of make a copy of it and turn it into a checklist. So I can go and edit this checklist if I want to, or I can delete it, and it does not affect the work plan. There's no way to do the reverse. So you can't take a checklist and turn it back into a work plan. There's really no need for that, because it's still a work plan. Um, OK. Next to the checklist box, this little star icon allows you to move a process tool around the, from inside of a, one process into another. So what I mean exactly is if you can take a work plan like this one, and if I hit this little move icon, move icon, now I'm going to be looking for the process I want to move this work plan into. So these are all my sub-functions from the four functions list. So I choose the sub-function, I find the process that I want to move it into, and then I hit save. And I'm not actually going to do this because I need to use this work plan. But if I hit save, it would disappear from this process, and it would move it inside the process I selected. So you use this icon when you want to combine processes. So say you kind of got too narrow with your process titles, and you decide you want to combine them together. You would take all the tools from one and move them into another. Um, you can also use this when you want to break processes apart. So say you got too broad with your process titles, or you decide for whatever reason you want to um, separate them. So you create an additional process title, and then you would take the tools out of one and move them into the other. Another good way that this move process tool is used is when you pull down a library process, and say you look at it and you like some of the tools in it, but you don't like others, and you have another process that's named that same thing. So you can take what you want from the library process and move it into your own process and then delete that library process. Next icon over, this is our print feature icon. You're going to see this all throughout Touchstone. So this icon allows you to print or export um, any tool inside of the process tools. So when I hit this little export button, I see these options to send directly to my printer, to export to Word, to export to a PDF, or to email. When you print directly to your printer, if you want to change the way that this is printed, like up here you see there, you, it might be a little hard to see, but you see these little web address up here. Um, and there's one down here. These are all controlled inside of your local printer settings. So it doesn't have anything to do with touchstones. You have to go into your printer and say, don't print with the web address, and then you won't get this little, um, you won't get this little address. So you can also email a process tool. So if you hit this email, you're going to put the to and the from and a subject, and then you hit send, and then it will take a copy of this work plan in this example and email it to whoever you directed it to. Everybody loves the export feature because it gives you peace of mind, right, that if you decide someday you don't want to use Touchstone anymore, which we hope you don't, but if you do, you can export everything out of Touchstone quite easily. Some people um, need to physically hold the paper in their hands. Um, you know, there are people like that. Um, but setting all that aside, my two cents on exporting things or printing things is that the minute you print this or export it, you've created a version of this that's outside of Touchstone. So if you print it, you've created another version and, in, in, in my opinion, wasted paper. So t the beauty of Touchstone is that it's in a paperless environment, that everything within it, there's no redundancy, everything is accurate, real time, and up to date. So if you want to move your business into this generation where 
Um, things are paperless. We store everything in the cloud, on the internet. Um, things are paperless, which it, you know helps resources, but also eliminates against redundancy. Then teach people to uh, view things in Touchstone. The more you get into it, the more it will become second nature to you. So one technique is if you want somebody to view this work plan, go up and copy the URL, right? Click copy, paste the URL into an email and say, hey, click this link and go look at this work plan. Look at the changes I've made. Um, go into the archive and look what it used to look like if you want to see what, what the changes I made or review it for me. Give me some feedback. Um, so rather than exporting things and having versions around that people are printing or they're worse yet, they're doing save as onto your computer and then suddenly your network is filled up with work plans that are different versions and you don't know if what's in Touchstone is the most current version, which is terrible. Um, get in a habit of like copying and referring to things inside of Touchstone and directing people to them in Touchstone. Uh, to the right of this, again, this is the archive box. All the tools archive in just the way that I showed you. Um, delete right here, and then there's this little handy help menus. So if you, you know, don't remember how to edit the title, um, you can just hit next. It kind of shows you what every single thing is inside of Touchstone. Okay, so let's talk about work plans specifically. So to make a work plan, all I do is click the title here, and then it's going to prompt me for the name of my work plan. It's also going to ask for the objective. So this, again, is the purpose. If you only have one work plan in a process, so only one, it has one workflow, one series of tasks, nothing else happens, then typically the name of that work plan and the objective are the same as the, the process itself. If you ever see this, I, this error message right here, it's letting me know that I have another work plan named this. <laughs> so this is part of the redundancy control inside of Touchstone. You only want things to exist once. Um, so if you put in a work plan and you get this error message, click on this link and find out where that work plan is. This sometimes happens when you have multiple departments and multiple people working in Touchstone. They'll go to make something, and they don't know that it already exists. And so this helps with that. Then I hit Create Work Plan, and there's my work plan. So what I was saying before is if I only have one work plan, the title of the process and the objective are usually the same of that one work plan. It's when you get multiple work plans in a process that the titles are a little different and they kind of describe what that workflow is and the objectives would be different. The work plans over here are all drag and drop too, so you can pull these up and down and put them in order if you have multiple work plans. So once I've built the work plan, the first thing I would do is add a task. So I click Add Task and then I clip, clip open this task field, and then I type in my first step or my first task, and then I hit Save. And then I go Add Task again, and now this is my second task. So this work plan is really forcing you into the step-by-step -step nature of good documentation. First step, second step, third step. We do this on purpose. We have it be a click to open the second task because it's pushing you into thinking about it in a step-by-step. -step. If it was just one field, it would just be like a Word document where people would ramble on and on and, and format things differently and, and they would all look and feel different based on who did it. This, um, the text is different based on who does it, um, but the actual format is similar. So if you have any work plans where someone has created one task and then put everything into that one task, you're missing the benefit of the step-by-step. -step. It won't print as well if you have to print things. You can't turn it into a checklist. You can't control the individual task fields because it's all one mess of tasks. So encourage people, um, if you see that in your documentation, to go step one, step two, task one, task two. Whenever I've opened a task like this one, if I was trying to go add task again, I'm going to get this error message. It's basically saying you can't go on and do something else because you've got this open. 
So you have to deal with this first. You have to save, cancel, or delete it before it's going to let you move on and do something else. The tasks are the to-do items. They're the one, two, three, four. And I'm going to talk in a minute about how to create good tasks. Um, but just remember that they are the steps, the actions. Below the tasks, there's this section here called expectations. And expectations are more things to know. They're more things to remember about when you're doing this work. They're standards. They're um, rules about the work plan. They're the qualities, the things that are more subjective, the things that aren't a part of the actions. Not every work plan will have expectations. Um, so what you want to do is after you're done documenting the steps or the task, think to yourself, is there anything extra that is important to know here? Is there any kind of quality or way this is done that's a little intangible that I can describe? A lot of times the expectations are the difference between just doing it, just following the steps, and really doing it well with quality. There will sometimes be work plans where all it is is a series of expectations. So there's no real actions to the process or to the work plan. There's no steps that are taken. It's just kind of things people need to know, um, tips that you have. So if you struggle with a certain type of process and you just can't find the actions, then sometimes, again, it just is expectation. So you can leave this task section blank and just put these all into the expectations field. So let's go over this toolbar. So this toolbar is the same toolbar that is throughout all of the process tools. It's the same. The first two icons here are for um, pasting. If you're cutting and pasting in from Word, it's good to paste it as text. Otherwise, if you keep the Word formatting, then the text is going to look different if it was different inside of Word. Um, so paste as text. Another way is to just right click, and I think all but Safari does this, where you can just do paste as plain text when you right click. Um, all these other tool, toolbar items are very similar to Microsoft Word. The font inside of Touchstone is 10-point Arial. It's the, a standardized kind of font size that looks good on most monitors. You can always increase the size by zooming in on your computer. You just hit Control plus plus plus, and you can make your screen larger. Um, I don't know if Macs are different, but see, I'm just making it larger here. In your browser, there's always a zoom, too, um, that you can use. So if you can't see it, it's too small for you, just make your screen larger. Um, when uh, work plans are printed, it, it defaults to 12 point, which is more standard for printing. Um, this is the hyperlink tool. So I'm going to show you some examples of hyperlinks in these other work plans. But to make a hyperlink, all you do is highlight the link word, the word you want to become the link. You go to this little hyperlink tool. You hit the drop down and you see all the link options. External link is the first type. This would be if you want to link to another website or another web page. Touchstone will link to anything that lives on the internet, including other web tools. So all you have to do is be logged into that web tool, so pass the username and password screen, and if you put in the URL for that tool, it's going to go right to it. So you can link to Google Docs, to a CRM, to any other kind of tool that lives on the internet. You just copy the URL and put, and put it in here. Sometimes I see that people have put in web addresses, even with this complicated extensions, into the task itself, and it just looks sloppy. So if you see that, just cut that out of your text and just paste it into here, and then it will be a, a nice link word instead of this messy kind of URL stretched across your text. All the other link types are things that are inside of Touchstone. So I can link from this task to another process. So let's say somebody needed information from a process to finish this task. Then I would go here to process. I'd find the process I want to link to and hit insert. And then Touchstone would take me right to this process. So this is preferable than repeating yourself or creating redundancy. If you're about to describe how to do something and, you, and it already exists inside a Touchstone, link to it rather than rep duplicating it. Because if you replicate the steps inside of multiple work plans of one thing, then when you go to update it, you have to remember where you had it all over Touchstone. So default more to have 
um, processes stand alone, and then you link from one to the other. Other link types are like checklists, scripts, uploaded files. This is a common thing to link to because you may have forms or documents or spreadsheets that are used inside of numerous processes, forms down here. So same idea for all of those. If I select this, I'm going to see a drop down in alphabetical order of all the forms I haven't touched on so far. I would find that uploaded file or form, and then once I hit insert, this becomes the link. You have to save a tool in order for the link to work. So now when I click it, it's taking me to that link. Another cool feature inside of the work plans is the image uploader, which is this tree icon at the end here. So this is for um, inserting screenshots into your tasks or literally pictures that you would take on a phone. You can save them to your computer or download them to your computer and then insert them into the tasks. Screenshots are fabulous for documentation. So any time that you can show how something's supposed to look, then it, it makes it easier for someone to understand. There's this great tool that I use. It's right up here. It's called Jing. Um, it's J-I-N-G. It's the free version of Snagit. So you can download this for free. It not only has um, a screen capture feature, but it also has a, um, a, a video feature where you can speak into your computer and click around and then save that as a video and then you can upload it down here to Touchstone. So with this tool, Jing, it, this is the tool right now, I can highlight and take a shot of whatever I want on the screen and when I let go, then I would say capture image. Then it gives you these um, cool little features where you can put in text if you want to. You can always type it into the work plan itself, but if you want to do this, you can. You can highlight things within the screenshot. You can put these cool little arrows saying, look here, and then look here. So when you're happy with the screenshot, then you just save it. I always put the, dump these onto my desktop, and it saves. I can always view it right here, because Jing will keep a file of all of your images. And then I would go to the Im image uploader, hit choose file, go to my desktop, find the image, hit open. If you only have one on your screen, it's easy to find. You hit insert, and then the image will appear. So use screenshots when you can. If you don't want to download Jing or you don't like that for whatever reason, every operating system comes with a, with a snipping tool. This is, I'm in, I have Windows, so this is a snipping tool. It's right here. You can just search for it, snipping tool. This is the same idea. It lets you take screenshots. What I don't like about this is that it doesn't have these fancy little arrows. All you can do is, like, draw like this. You can't really, and when you do an arrow, it, it looks kind of sloppy. So use screenshots whenever you can. Um, all, the tasks are all drag, drag and drop on work plans. So you see I just took task two and made it one and one, two. So you can pull them up and pull them down to adjust the order. Okay, so let's talk about what makes a good work plan. So this is just an example of a work plan. If you have a training video, then make it the first task of your work plan. Watch the training video. Here again in Jing, I can take a, a video right here, capture video, one, two, three, it's giving me a countdown, then I'd be speaking into the voice over internet, and I'm clicking around, and all the time it's capturing my screen movements, and then when I'm done, I hit finish, and then, oh, you know, here's your nice little video, so, and you can upload it down to the, the um, into the video upload tool. Tasks should be um, clear and straightforward. They usually start with an action word, schedule, write, prepare, complete, do this, do that. So think of the actions that you take. Um, don't write tasks as narratives like this one. See this? So this is a paragraph of instructions, basically. Some people uh, write in, they see things in pictures, and they write like a story. That's their writing style. It's not good for documentation. 
um, when you write things as a paragraph, as a story, someone needs to read it and try to understand what you're saying. And when they're following steps, it's harder to kind of find, what am I doing here in this paragraph? This text is the same as this text. But you can see here in four how it's much easier to follow this with your eyes. The sample letter, the referral contact, the target descriptions, do this, do that. They're using, we're using bullets and sub-bullets to kind of break things apart. You can take any narrative, any paragraph of information, or any story and kind of break it into specific parts by using bullets and sub-bullets, which are all inside of the toolbar. So think of clear, specific language when you're writing it. Um, utilize hyperlinks whenever you can. Like here's a link to a letter, which is actually an uploaded file in this process. Link to a checklist. So your work plan um, should reference the other tools if they exist here in the process. Um, write if-then statements if you need to. So if this happens, then do this. Sometimes things are pretty rudimentary, so the tasks go one, two, three, four, but then you get to a place where it's like, well, what if this happens, then what do we do? So you handle that with these if-then statements. It's the variable part of things. People always, I, I often hear, well, I cannot document that because it's so variable. It just depends. Well, that's true to a certain degree, but it doesn't always depend. And there are typically uh, ways that it would go and ways that it wouldn't go. So this whole, when you see things as variables, as happening all over the place in different ways, you focus on those variables to try to figure out what to do. But what you fail to see is what is consistent. So focus on what is consistent. Think about if it was to go in the best way possible, how would it go? And then handle the rest with if then. If this, then that. If that, then this. It may or may not happen in the same way every time, but if for training purposes and for um, uh, reference purposes, if you have some if-thens, then that, that helps people. Utilize screenshots when you can, like this one. I have here log into the CRM and go to the contact screen. So I've got a picture of the contact screen, which is nice, but then if I click this link, it's actually it's going to stop me at the, well, I'm already logged in. So this is our CRM, and it takes you right to the contact screen. So you can do both. You can have screen, you can have links that go directly to another tool or whatever you're talking about, or you can do pictures. If you're referring to software like a spreadsheet or QuickBooks or something like that that's not on the internet, then use screenshots to show what and how and where to go. Um, here's an example of, of one task linking to another process. So here in 16, I've got enter leads into the CRM. Well, we enter leads into the CRM in probably five different processes. Many people do that in different situations. So I don't want to repeat how to do that in every single one of those processes. Instead, I've got a process called CRM how-tos, and I have a work plan on how to enter the leads. This could be a link to a help center inside of your CRM if you have that. So you could put a link directly to you know, the help center inside of whatever CRM you use if you have that. So don't recreate things that already exist inside of another help center uh, if you're talking about software or equipment or anything like that. Um, but a lot of times we make customizations to these software tools, so the help centers inside of the tools don't often always help because you might do it a little differently. Um, so screen captures are the way to go there. Again, with expectations, um, think about the timing of something, when it happens, subjective things to consider, standards, qualities. So the work plans in the end are this step-by-step -step set of instructions or tasks explaining exactly what to do. So when I look at work plans, the first, and, and people ask me, what do you think? The very first thing is always, well, it doesn't have enough detail. It's usually that. Or you get some people who just go totally overboard describing things in, in major minutiae that just get to be way overdone. 
So how to gauge if something is documented well enough is to first decide um, who is going to be performing this work and what are the minimum qualifications of that position or person. So this goes back to your recruiting and hiring. So inside of your recruiting processes, there should be um, qualifications listed. So inside of every good recruiting process, the ones you should have in Touchstone, there should be a form for every box on your org chart that describes the minimum qualifications of that position. So I'm talking about like years of experience, um, education, uh, ability to uh, work uh, in certain software tools. So you want to think, what are the minimum qualifications? The more qualifications that are required, typically the more expensive that person is going to be, right? So if you can um, minimize the minimum qualifications and then have your documentation do the training, then you can typically hire people for less. So that's something to think about. But in speaking back in terms of, of the details in a work plan, think about those minimum qualifications and then write the work plan from that point forward. So for example, if you require that your employee that's going to be doing this work um, understand Microsoft Office products, then you don't need to describe um, how to uh, open a Word document, how to um, do handle Gmail, how to run a spreadsheet. You don't need to explain those things because they already know that. So the work plan doesn't need to describe it. But on the other hand, if you're hiring a, um, an entry-level position and they aren't required to have a college education and you need to train them in how to open a spreadsheet, well then your work plan needs to do that. Or you need to have some kind of link to some kind of tutorial that they learn. So think about the minimum qualifications and then document the work plan from that point forward. Think about what this person already knows when you hire them and then put all the other details in that they're going to need to use and follow. If there is software that you're requiring they already know before you would hire them, then again, you don't need tutorials on how to run that software. Consider when you're documenting um, how well this is going to train that employee. Another thing to consider when you're documenting is to think about the way that you do it now and then as you're creating the task, consider how it could be better. This is something that happens all the time. You want to get people to document and they just write what is. And this is an opportunity for you to think, well, what more could this be? What more could we do? How could we make it better? So take that as an opportunity to really think through the details. When a work plan's been documented, um, have someone review it. Have another person who's the manager of the person, people who do it or um, another person within the department that also does that work but didn't document it. Have that person review it and put their eyes on it. Because you can look for structural things like, are they breaking in bullet points? Is it easy to find? Are they utilizing hyperlinks? Did they put in screenshots? But the actual steps themselves, sometimes it takes someone else who has done that work for a long time to really kind of understand what to do or how to, how to make it better. Um, all these titles are quick to edit, by the way, too. So if you want to edit titles or the objectives of a work plan, it's all quick to edit. Remember that you can have multiple work plans. So if you're documenting something and you notice that there are other things that happen and those things are related to this process, then put them as work plans inside the process. A good thing to do before you even go in and start documenting is to, do is to create the work plans. So think about what's going to go in this process. Read the objective to yourself and think, are there multiple steps or multiple workflows, multiple things that happen, or is it just one series of tasks? If there are multiple things that happen, then have within this overall umbrella called referral development, then have multiple work plans. So here, this is a good example. We generate referrals from existing clients, and there's a whole series of tasks on how to do that. We also generate referrals from strategic alliances, and there's a whole other series of tasks on how to do that. So those are two separate steps, 
two separate work plans. Here is another example I think I've shown before. Simple example. This is the accounts payable process. All these work plans are the things that are done related to paying bills. So I've got them identified as separate work plans. When you break apart work plans, another thing to consider is um, whether a work plan is done um, in different situations. So if we generate referrals from alliances, say, also when we're at networking events, but then we also do it in different situations, that would be another reason to keep this a separate work plan because I can link this to another process. If it was all one work plan, you can't link tasks from one work plan to another process. You link the whole work plan. OK, let's talk about checklists next. So this is an example of a checklist. The <clears throat> checklist tool works exactly the same way as the work plan tool. In fact, all of these tools work the same way. I just hit the title if I want to build one. I put in the name of it. I put in the objective or the purpose. The objectives of other tools, like checklists, scripts, uploaded files, are important to think about. Um, you want to consider why it's used for a checklist, and put that into the objective if you can. Used to ensure referral um, process steps have been followed. If you can build a purpose into the objective, then when an employee is looking at this and having to do it, it helps them to understand the bigger picture behind it. So then I hit Create Checklist, and now I've got two checklists here. So just hit the title, put the name in, hit Create. To build this, I just click Add Checklist Item, and I'm seeing the title and the description. I click open the title. This is, this is going to be the words next to the box, so right next to the checklist box. Save. Description is anything more, so it's further details that need to be known about this box, about this step. So that would be my first checklist item. If I want to do another one, I hit checklist item again, and this is you know, the second checklist item and the second description. These, again, are all drag and drop, just like the tasks. So when you build a checklist, the main purpose of a checklist is to have verification that something's been done. So think to yourself, does this process need quality control? Does it need uh, evidence that the steps have been followed? Um, do I need verification so that I could go back six months from now and look to see that it was done? Is the process so complicated with lots of different um, components to it that an employee themselves really needs to remember what they've done and what they haven't done? Because they go back to it multiple times before it's finished. Does another department need to have evidence that certain steps were done before they do something else? So think about the meaning behind the checklist, the purpose of it. Don't just create a checklist just because it seems to be a good idea or you like checklists. Really think about the, the result you want to get from it. There is such a thing as having too many checklists. And if every process has a checklist in it, that means you've got 50 or 60 processes with checklists. I think that's too many. Because you can't, there's not that many situations where you would really need, want someone to spend the time to fill out a checklist um, in, in, every, in every bit of work that they do. So when you have a checklist, I think it's important to be committed to making sure that it's filled out and used. It has to be managed. If you build a bunch of checklists and you pass them off to employees and say, I want you to be using these, do it in Touchstone, save them all back to Touchstone, and then you as the manager don't ever go and look at them, then it's going to be a very short amount of time before the employees just stop doing them. So when you build a checklist, be committed to managing it. And what I mean by that is look at it at least once a week. Just review that all the checklists have been done. You might just glance through, see that they're done, and then move on. And if you um, see one missing for the day or you see one um, missing in a certain situation, go right back to the employee and say, these checklists are important for this reason. I really need you to fill them out. And if you do that consistently for you know, a certain number of months, then employees are going to, over time, it's going to become second nature to them. 
So think about if the process needs a checklist, if you need quality control, if you need verification, and then if the answer is yes, then build one inside the process. Again, you can take a work plan like this one and with one click turn it into a checklist. Or you can go down and build one that's independent of a work plan. If you turn a work plan into a checklist, I think a good idea is to like pare it down a little bit. So like go to a task like this one and say prepare for the introductory appointment and then maybe delete this and keep it like that. <clears throat> and the reason is you don't, they don't need all the detail of how to do this inside the checklist. That's in the work plan. And over time, when people learn things, they memorize them. They don't need to refer back to the details of how to do it. And the checklist is just verification. Did this, did this, did this, did this. I'm not reading this trying to remember how to do that. If I need to remember how, I can always go back to the work plan. So clear, specific, easy to kind of track with your eye checklist are the best. Short little reminders of what to do. With the home screen functionality here, when you set up control panels like this one, employees can go to these checklists and fill them out right inside a touchstone. So this is just a reminder of that. Inside of what we call the control panel, which is what we're looking at right now, I have a list of all the processes that I'm responsible for. So I can go into um, these processes and I can access checklists, like this one, for new employee onboarding, and I can fill them out right here inside of Touchstone. And I can date and time stamp them just by saving it. I can put a save as with the employee's name if I want to. I can put in notes to my manager on what happened or what didn't happen well with this onboarding. And every time I save this checklist, it's saving a copy of it right here inside of this process in this completed folder. And I see all the checklists that I've done over time. So this is a great way to utilize the control panel features in Touchstone if you have checklists. Because you can have employees go in, fill them out, save them really quick. Call it up. I want another one for another employee I'm onboarding. This is a blank copy. Fill that out. Save it back to Touchstone. Then a manager who wants to verify it's been done can go here and run a report and do a date and time or do it by employee, by user, and you hit run report, and then you're going to see a list of all the checklists done. So just once a week, every Monday and Friday or Monday and Wednesday, just run a report and say, oh, they did them all that week. They're all there. Great. If somebody missed it, then you can email them and say, hey, I, I don't see your checklist for this date. Okay, so next week we're going to finish up the, um, our conversation on the process tools, and I'm going to talk about um, the purpose of all the other tools and how to use them. In the last few minutes, I want to go to our uh, process of the week. It is under doing the business here, and it's called uh, client satisfaction. So inside of doing the business, or sometimes people have it inside of running the business, there should be a sub-function for client service customer service, whatever you want to call it. And then you should have key processes within there that are about how you take care of your customers. One of the most important being making sure that they're satisfied, right? It is the most important thing. No matter what type of business you have, making sure that your customers are satisfied with the product or service that you're delivering them um, is key. Um, here are some statistics that I love around um, client service or customer satisfaction. These are just uh, examples of why this is so important. We all get so busy with the work that we do, we often don't think about um, the, the, the benefit of making sure that we keep our current customers or making sure that they say positive things about the business or that they feel like their product or service was great. Even if you don't have repeat business, um, which is pretty rare, but sometimes there are businesses like that, those people are going all out and talking about you, regardless of whether they would ever buy from you again. So making sure clients or customers are satisfied is absolutely important. People sometimes think it's all about price. Price is not the main reason for customer churn. It's actually due to overall poor quality of service. 
A customer is four times more likely to defect to a competitor if the problem is service related, not price. You all experience this. We, we, we all buy things from companies that ha we have terrible service and we never go back again. The same thing happens in, in all of our businesses. The profitability or probability of selling to an existing customer is 60 to 70 percent. The probability of selling to a new prospect, 5 to 20 percent. This is basically saying it's easier to sell more to your existing customers. For every customer complaint, there are 26 other unhappy customers that remain silent. You know this is true. I say this every week. I'm like, I'm just never going back there. But do I stop and, and tell them why? Well, I can't be bothered because I'm busy. 2% increase in customer retention is the same as decreasing costs by 10%. This one I love, number five. A 2% increase in customer retention. How easy would that be? is the same as decreasing your overall cost by 10%. Isn't that huge? So this goes on and on, and this is in the library. You can read it. But what's meant to happen, here, what my intention is with this, is to get some motivation behind building a customer service process that will help you um, retain your current customers and will make the point to your employees how important it is to keep um, understand how your service is being, um, how your customers feel about the service or the products that they're getting. So a first step in this is to develop a list of client service standards or customer service standards. This is a big list, but it's in the library just to give you some examples of the types of things. Sit together with your employees or send an email out and say, what do we believe in? What are our customer service goals? And have people give you feedback. If you had just five of these, it kind of sets the stage for um, what your company needs to do, what you need to live up to. Um, again, this is a lot. I don't think you need 18, maybe five or six of this key. This is what we believe in. We believe um, that we need to answer questions from our website within 24 hours. We believe that every customer should have a quality control or quality service meeting. So whatever your beliefs are, if you violate those beliefs, if you go against them, it's going to be obvious. Because when people are talking and they said they complain about the customer, everyone around them will say, well, no, this, these are our customer service standards. So first step, just document your standards. Make them real for you. The next thing is decide on the vehicle for how you're going to Contact a customer at the end of your work with them or ongoing if your work is ongoing and ask them how you did. People do surveys. We have some surveys in here if you need to do surveys. There's email surveys. There's you know, written surveys. Not everybody fills out surveys. So really the best way is to call the customer directly and say, um, how was your service? How did that project go for you? How did you like our product? How was that um, interaction for you? Call them up. You do have time to make these phone calls. That's what people are thinking. I don't have time to make the phone calls. Yes, you do. Because remember this? M remember these? <laughs> this is why you have the time. A 10% decrease in your cost, just 2% better. You do have the time. You have to take the time. So make these calls. There's a sample script in here. Um, there's a, a, a work plan example for making calls. All this needs to be customized for your situation. It's the concept that's important in the library process, that you decide what the vehicle is. If you're going to do surveys, fine, but spend some time to make actual phone calls. When a customer complains to you and your customer complaint process kicks in, it's too late then, isn't it? Find out in advance because of this statistic that um, they're not going to come back and tell you. It's very uncommon that the customer comes back and tells you. For every customer complaint, there are 26 other unhappy customers. Unless they want their money back and they're very bold and they deserve their money back, they're not going to call you and complain. So think about all those missed opportunities. Think about collecting good feedback as well. So making these phone calls, what benefit would that have to you? Well, hopefully you generate referrals from it. So this is a whole referral opportunity. If the job went well, then um, 
ask for referrals. Ask for uh, something to put on your website. So it's a win-win either way. When you get a negative response from a customer, how did the job go? Well, I liked this, but I didn't like this. That is a gem, what they didn't like. There's always going to be one-off situations where the customer's crazy, but for the most part, those little one-off gems are essential to you because you can think about that. Why did that job not go well? What are they saying? And then you can go back to Touchstone and decide what processes here in our operations need to change. How can we edit or change slightly what we do so that that complaint doesn't exist anymore? And, and this is extremely valuable because every time you take a, a customer's frustration and you take that frustration and come up with a real solution for it and then implement that solution, your business has just gotten better. The quality is higher. It's not just, uh, and when you document it into a process, it's lasting quality. So think about your client satisfaction process. What would it entail? Are you going to do surveys? If you did quick customer service calls, um, what would that look like? When would you do them? Who would do them? You can also track all of this in Touchstone. So here, um, there's a customer service person, Mary here. She's got this uh, client satisfaction um, process in her, on her job description. Here's all the tools for what she does. As she do, do, does these things, she can fill them out right inside a touchstone. She can go and complete checklists. She can fill out forms. I, as her manager, can go and run a report here and say, let me see what ideas Mary um, came up with for her customer service calls. I run this little report. I go to that process. And I could have searched for that specifically, but I'm trying to be a little fast here. So here's client satisfaction. Here's a client satisfaction call that she had, a form that she filled out with this client. And it's right here. So the manager can look at it, review it, um, to see if there's opportunities to um, have better client satisfaction. So this process is in our library in the doing the business function. Add from process library, you can pull it down right here. There's also the client complaints process, which is in the library as well. So these two kind of go hand in hand, because if there is a complaint that comes up from the satisfaction call, then uh, you can go launch into this process, which is more details on how you specifically deal with that complaint. So thanks for coming, everybody. This um, next week, we're going to continue on with um, how to document using the process tools. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye. So